That's okay. Uh, okay, well, welcome everyone. If you're a fan of comics, film, history, or pop culture, tonight's presentation may be of interest to you. The East Baton Rouge Parish Library is proud to connect our community with great books, authors, and other resources. This evening, we're connecting you with Stephen Andes. He's the LSU professor and the author of Zorro's Shadow, How a Mexican Legend Became America's First Superhero. This presentation is being recorded, but if you're joining us live, please feel free to send us any questions or comments in the chat. Hi, Stephen. Hello, here we are. <laughs> yeah, uh, please excuse if there are any delays. We're working with the technology we have. So I'm gonna let you introduce yourself, Stephen, and then let you tell us all about Zorro and why we should care. Okay, so thanks so much uh, to Jessica and to the library for this chance to share some of my work. Um, I am Stephen Andes. Uh, I am a history professor at Louisiana State University. And um, I have been on a journey and I wanna share a little bit of that with you. So uh, just a second while I share my screen and I have a little bit of a PowerPoint All right, so for the last two years, I've set out uh, to find the origins to Zorro. I read all the books by Johnston McCauley, the, uh, the, the guy that created Zorro in 1919. Um, I read the comics by Toth and Kinsler, McGregor, Matt Wagner, David Avalone, the list goes on, right? Uh, in short, I became a little bit obsessed. And so tonight what I want to do is I'll have about 30 minutes to share with you some, just some, just a crumb, just a skosh uh, what I learned. The rest, of course, uh, you can find out uh, more about in our Q&A. We can talk um, as well as in my new book called Zorro's Shadow, How a Mexican Legend Became America's First Superhero. And so we can talk about anything you want in the Q&A period. So... Uh, without further ado, you know, uh, we have uh, an anniversary coming up of sorts, right? Uh, this marks, 2020 marks 100 years of the first Zorro film that was created, right? And so we're going to question why Zorro matters for us 100 years later. And so what we'll learn, three acts in a denouement. First, uh, the first act, we'll talk about Doug and Mary, Hollywood's first power couple, how they gambled on love and costume adventure films. Um, act two, we'll talk about The Mark of Zorro, the film itself in 1920. Um, it was the biggest action film of its time and in many ways uh, set the standard for the action adventure film um, to come. It was a silent film, of course. Uh, but still, it did a, a lot to set about the idea of what an action adventure film should be. In Act Three, we'll look at how all of this began to set a blueprint for the superhero genre itself. Superman uh, created in 1938, Batman created in 1939, and the influence of Zorro and Fairbanks, uh, the first Zorro. Uh, on those comic book creations. And then finally, the denouement, this sort of uh, untangling of the knots and of our plot, we'll try to bring it together with trying to understand superhero origins in Latinx history. All right. Uh, and so, but first, before I get started, I don't want to forget to emphasize what this all means, right? Why is Zorro important? Not as a crucial part of forming the superhero genre, right, which he was and is, but Zorro is important, is important for another reason. And Zorro is important to our present because Zorro was real, right? And hopefully that will make sense at the end. And if it doesn't, then uh, I have failed. But I have good hope that uh, we won't fail. All right, so first, 
what is your favorite Zorro, right? When you think about Zorro, you probably have a specific actor in mind. For me, I always think about uh, Antonio Banderas, right? In 1998 film, The Mask of Zorro with Anthony Hopkins and Catherine Zeta-Jones, um, Antonio Banderas. That's usually what comes to my mind. But for others, it's Guy Williams, right? The um, uh, photo over here, um, Guy Williams, the man in the mask. Actually, that was the the uh, the cover for my book. That I, is my favorite, probably picture of Zorro. Um, he was the Disney Zorro in the 1950s. He was the actor that played uh, Don Diego and Zorro in the 1950s Disney um, series. But then the guy in the middle here is Tyrone Power. 1940, Warner Brothers did a reboot of the 1920 film, also called The Mask, uh, or sorry, The Mark of Zorro, Mark Mask, The Mark of Zorro. Um, and uh, uh, he was the heartthrob of the day, right? He vied with Errol Flynn for perhaps the best man bottom of his age, right? With his sort of very tight fitting uh, uh, sort of pants that he wore in that film. Uh, reviewers, I, I chuckled as I read reviews about people, reviewers commenting on his tight pants, right? Um, but actually none of these guys here, whether Banderas, Tyrone Power, or Guy Williams actually started or, or were actually the first Zorro. The first Zorro was a guy named um, Douglas Fairbanks, Douglas Fairbanks, okay? Now, the actor that started it all was sort of a kind of Tom Cruise of his day, plus Jackie Chan rolled all into one, right? Uh, he, you know, he he had sort of this this air of masculinity of uh, of sort of the almost muscular Christianity of, um, but also he did lots of his own stunts like. Tom Cruise says he does, uh, but but in another way he was kind of a, a a Jackie Chan. It's interesting. Even today, you can see the um, um, on Facebook on Twitter, uh, people have uh, interesting gifts where they split one screen with Douglas Fairbanks doing stunts and then Jackie Chan. And there's a lot of similarity in the kinds of stunts, the the physicality that they did, um, and so. He flitted, he strut, he did all of his own stunts. And in the 1920s, Fairbanks had a string of action films, right? The Three Musketeers, Robin Hood, The Thief of Baghdad, uh, Don Q, Son of Zorro, The Black Pirate, The Gaucho, The Iron Mask, right? And it all started with um, The Mark of Zorro. I'm sorry, I put The Mask of Zorro. See, uh, the mark of Zorro, right? So um, in fact, though, this film, The Mark of Zorro, set a radically different direction for Fairbanks' own career, so much so that he is really actually remembered for the films that he did in the 1920s. And it all started with Zorro. But why? The question is why. Why did he decide to gamble on doing the Zorro film? From hindsight, it looks like the obvious choice, right? He's known for all these films. He uh, was sort of like the action adventure god of his day, but not from the perspective of 1920, because in 1920, nobody really was doing historical costume films, right? Set in the past, that was something that was inaugurated really with this movie, The Mark of Zorro in 1920. In fact, uh, Fairbanks was really known for his romantic comedies before that time. It's a, a, a bit like, uh, you know, obviously uh, a uh, actor like Tom Hanks has done lots of serious roles and is actually more probably known for his serious roles than his comedic ones that he got a start in. But it's it's a little like uh, uh, Tom, Tom Hanks doing um, a film like Big and then his next film is Indiana Jones, right? There's There was a big risk and a change in his persona in going into 1920 in The Mark of Zorro. 
Fairbanks was known for his pseudo suit and tie comedies, his romantic comedy. One film in particular was called The Molly Coddle. And the model is this word actually coined, uh, a, neologism, a neologism coined by Teddy Roosevelt, right? Who said, you know, we don't need uh, uh, liars and molly coddles, you know, not able to sort of stand up to uh, the world and, you know, bring democracy abroad, right? And so Fairbanks actually paid money in order to use this word molly coddle uh, as the title of his film. And it basically in the film, he plays a wimp who finds his metal, his his sort of inner, uh, uh, you know, sort of masculine soul out west. He's formed by the west. Perhaps it's a little bit of a rehearsal for the Don Diego fop character that he would play in Zorro. So again, why did he take this chance in this gamble? Well, one part of the equation is that Fairbanks was not the only part of the equation. Right. The answer is because Fairbanks was only part of a larger dynamic duo, as it were, and because the other part of that dynamic duo was actually a much better business person than Fairbanks. And that was, of course, Mary Pickford, known as America's Sweetheart. Right. The, the later reboot in the 1990s, America's Sweetheart, is, is really based on Mary Pickford, right? This the most famous actress in the world at the time, right? From 1910 to 1930 or so, she was one of the most recognizable faces around the globe in the silent era. And it it didn't hurt that you didn't really need to translate whole films; you just had to translate the interstitial uh, uh, cards, right, between scenes. Um, to into the local language and you could show it anywhere. And so she was internationally known at the time. So we've of course heard of Brangelina, we've heard of Benifer, but we also should think about Doug and Mary, right? Their house that they bought was called Pickfair, uh, sort of a portmanteau of both Pickford and Fairbanks. And that really sort of idea came, the power couple came from Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks. But how did their relationship start? If their relationship was important for bringing Zorro to the screen, how did their relationship come about? Well, it itself was a love story, right? It seems that, uh, you know, Mary Pickford, as I've said, was this well-known uh, face throughout the world. She was actually um, so well-known that she became the first actress to have a million dollar contract, which works out to around 43 million in today's dollars. They, Doug, uh, Doug and Mary met in 1915 when Fairbanks moved to Hollywood. They instantly clicked. Um, they, during World War I, they began to sell war bonds uh, with the guy on Fairbanks' shoulder is none other than Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin and Douglas Fairbanks were sort of BFFs forever, right? Um, and uh, their romance budded in that situation. The problem was, is they were both already married. In the 1970s, after the death of Mary Pickford, a chest of Pickford's secret love letters were found and historians have used these. And in one of these love letters, while they were both still married, Douglas wrote uh, Mary Pickford, um, uh, you know, sort of all of his romantic ard uh, ardor in, in, in sort of these letters. He's, in one of the letters he said, a mere thought of you stimulates as nothing else can. You have grown sweeter, lovelier, bigger, I can't tell you how thrilled I am at all times. Your intelligence, your beauty, your kindness, your sense of justice. Oh, I am wild about you, right? And so uh, after the World War I, all of them ended up going into business together. Fairbanks, Pickford, Chaplin, and the guy with the hat on in the picture there is D.W. Griffith, the, uh, the director of the infamous movie, The Birth, Birth of a Nation. 
Um, but anyway, they started United Arts Company. So after they started United Artists, they ended up both getting a divorce to their respective spouses, and uh, they promptly married each other. It was something like three weeks from the time that Pickford's divorce was finalized and she married Douglas Fairbanks. But that itself was a gamble. They uh, gambled that their you know, loving audience would actually accept them because uh, divorcing and remarrying in the way that they did in 1920 was uh, not seen as, uh, you know, sort of virtuous. It wasn't seen as um, uh, upholding the sort of wholesome on-screen uh, personas that they had. And that uh, wholesome on-screen persona was supposed to follow them off-screen as well. They go on honeymoon. They get married, they go on honeymoon. And what do they find? They don't find rejection. They find open arms throughout uh, Europe. Everywhere they go, they're, meted, they're, they're met by adoring crowds. At one point, uh, Douglas Fairbanks right, had to sort of full back hustle Mary Pickford through the crowd, you know, showing off his prowess, um, he, you know, uh, in order to protect his bride from the crushing crowd, et cetera, and so forth. And so they they go off and they they get married, they go to honeymoon. And on that overseas voyage, on the way over to Europe, Mary Pickford picks up a story from the pulps, from pulp fiction, right? Pulp fiction called such because of the pulpy material that it was uh, uh, printed on, as well as perhaps because of sometimes the the sort of low culture stories that it told, or, or uh, you know, so called. Um, but one of the, one of the stories that she read was actually from All Story Weekly, a little story by Johnston McCulley, uh, titled "The Curse of Capistrano." In it, we meet Zorro for the first time. Um, and you can see the All Story Weekly, the first depiction of Zorro anywhere was this sort of almost Merlin-esque, uh, you know, sort of pointed hat that's supposed to be maybe a sombrero or something with a cape and a sword, but also a gun. Zorro was big on using a gun at first, just like Batman was big at on using a gun at first as well. Essentially, Mary Pickford told uh, Douglas Fairbanks to buy it and to use it as his next film. And Fairbanks, the guy that didn't read much as it were, uh, he um, said, yes, Mary, I will. And that's how Zorro was born for the screen. And promptly when they got back from their honeymoon, Douglas Fairbanks um, went full throttle into doing this new kind of action film. It seems perhaps if a gambit, a, gam a gamble on love, right? He'd risked it all in one, perhaps uh, a, a gamble on Zorro would also pay off and pay off it did. And so with that, we go to act two, the mark of Zorro itself. The mark of Zorro, as I said, turns 100 years old this fall. On November 29th, 1920, the silent film debuted in New York City to throngs of uh, clamoring patrons. And you can see uh, the middle photo there, uh, a scene outside. You can see Douglas Fairbanks, the Mark of Zorro um, at the Capitol Theater in uh, New York City. The movie absolutely blew viewers away. And what I wanna do is show you some clips and you can see some of the action and stunts that uh, that Fairbanks did. We'll make sure to turn down the music. The movie blew viewers away, right? With its mix of daring do stunts and romance, Zorro's filmic premiere in 1920 produced, provided fantasy and escapism at a time when Americans were really in need of these, right? You think about the end of World War I, there would have been millions dead, right? And now peace had come, but there was also uh, quite a bit of pessimism. 
This is when you see the birth of uh, the lost generation, your Hemingways, your uh, Fitzgeralds, right? Uh, writing with a jaundiced eye on, uh, uh, you know, sort of American optimism. But here comes Zorro with all the optimism anybody can spare. Also, you have the great influenza, AKA the Spanish flu. Also millions dying, uh, souring the horizons of millions. Perhaps it sounds familiar, right? To us at present, we find ourselves still in the grips of a global pandemic and looking ahead to November general elections with a mix perhaps of fear and dread. We'd all like a little fantasy and escape. And that's the mom moment in which the mark of Zorro hit, right? This place uh, uh, provided a picture of the past where the hero won, right? Where uh, the dashing hero uh, was almost sort of bigger than life. But here's the important question. Why should we care about the mark of Zorro on its 100th anniversary? The movie certainly made a splash. It heralded the rise of the action adventure genre. Douglas thinks, right, he skylarked and jumped, he rolled and tumbled, um, right? One, one uh, uh, reviewer at the time from the New York Times admitted there couldn't be another hero like Fairbanks. He's bigger than any uh, hero from literature. Zorro was bigger, faster, stronger than other heroes, mainly because of the medium of film, right? This newish medium of film, right? It wasn't brand new in 1920, but yet here is the, the way in which all of these threads come together, the storytelling, the sense of escapism, the sense of fantasy, but with kind of filmic projection of our desires, of uh, uh, a way to escape, our fears, a way to believe and have optimism that uh, even though Spanish was said to be, uh, or Zorro was Spanish, even though Zorro was Spanish, um, there was a sense that he embodied American ideals of optimism and uh, can do this, right? The film transformed expectations of how stories themselves should be told. Movies, could literally project fan onto these projector screens. Fairfax became a hero, perhaps almost super, right? And so after Fairbanks, uh, after the 1920 version of Zorro, Throughout the uh, 1920s, there were some sequels. Uh, then in the 1930s, they were serialized and sort of Republic Pictures did the after Saturday afternoon matinee serials of Zorro. And those are the kind of movies that uh, young comic artists like uh, Siegel and Schuster and Kane and, and Finger grew up on, the creators of Superman and Batman. In 1938, right, uh, uh, creators like Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster looked to the ideal of action and adventure that they saw in a film like The Mark of Zorro and used that in their creation of this even bigger than life hero. The superhero with superpowers, right? They enlarged those powers into superpowers. This is even more clear in the creation of Batman, of course, right? By day, he's the sort of millionaire, um, you know, ineffectual, sometimes foppish, uh, kind of dandy, but then by night, he's this Avenger, that uh, dark brooding Avenger. Bill Finger, for instance, the co-creator of Batman, was known to paste film stills of Fairbanks doing stunts and in different uh, positions, right, um, on his scripts for for art direction, right? And you can see that there, the stills, I uh, selected phone, uh, photos to finish scripts 
to Bob uh, Kane and assistants to use as models for their drawings of Batman. Right. And so Zorro matters, um, of course, because the character became a blueprint, an archetype for later superheroes like Superman and Batman. So since, yes, Zorro matters because uh, he laid the blueprint for later superheroes that became even bigger and faster and stronger, right? So that's, an but also there's, there's, there's more to the story, right? And this sort of uh, will be our sort of denouement, our unraveling of some of these things to try to look at superhero origins and Latinx history, right? There's more. Beyond all the talk about Zorro being America's first superhero, which I argue about in my new book, um, Zorro matters because he was real. Now, before you write me off as perhaps, uh, you know, one panel short of a finished comic book, hear me out. Zorro was real in the sense, uh, you know, he wasn't real in the sense, he was not real in the sense that there was a guy named Don Diego de la Vega that actually lived. Right. That was a creation. Don Diego de la Vega was a creation in 1919 of Johnston McCauley, the pulp, pulp fiction writer. So Zorro didn't actually flit and strut uh, about old California, sort of carving his retribution into the foreheads of his enemies, like some character out of Tarantino's and Glorious Bastards. He wasn't uh, real in that sense. But Zorro and his Don Diego alter ego, right, were of course made in 1919, but Zorro was real in another sense, right? If Zorro was an archetype, a blueprint for other later superheroes, I found in the course of my research that uh, a real life prototype existed for Zorro. Johnston McCulley drew on the legend of Joaquin Murrieta in fashioning his fictional character. And who is Joaquin Murrieta? Well, you can see him pictured here. This is one of the first depictions of Murrieta in the 1850s. Um, he was a, a Mexican bandit in the era of the gold rush. And it's fascinating, and hopefully my face is not covering up Superman here, but you can see that uh, the very famous pose of Superman, you know, ripping open his shirt to show his symbol of, you know, Superman on his chest looks very much like uh, Joaquin Murrieta opening up his shirt and declaring to those assembled, I am Joaquin. I am Joaquin. Everybody knew this sort of famous Joaquin and he had gone incognito into this, uh, this uh, card hall and everybody was sitting around saying, if I found Murrieta, I would, you know, I would kill him and I, you know, he would stand no chance against me. But Murrieta finally gets up on the table and says, yo soy Joaquin, I am Joaquin, right? In this self-revelation, -revela re just like later superheroes. And so another example here, I don't know. We can see. Um, so it should be noted that much of the legend of Murrieta is almost as fictional as the Zorro character, right? Murrieta lived in the age of the gold, California gold rush. So much was written about him. Newspaper accounts, a, a, a novel, the first novel basically of California um, uh, in the 1850s was written um, about Murrieta, right? But he lived in, but there is b some basis to the legend, right? The story goes that after his wife was raped by Anglo prospectors, Murrieta came from Northern Mexico to look for gold. And once he was there, he found himself persecuted by Anglo settlers who said, oh, well, uh, this might have been, you know, part of Mexico like a year ago, but now it's part of the United States and you're now a foreigner. So you have to pay an extra tax to look in gold mines. 
Murrieta didn't like that, so he ran into trouble. Uh, he was persecuted by uh, these Anglo settlers. His wife was raped. Uh, his brother-in-law was lynched, right? And that drove him into a life of banditry, as the story goes. To Mexican-Americans, at the time, he became a kind of a binging ghost, ready to repay the wrongs done to his people. But to Anglo-Americans, he was a scourge, a figure that was maligned. And so here you can see one example of the way in which the Murrieta uh, made its way into Zorro was this reward poster, the famous wanted poster that re appears in virtually every Zorro film, um, and even in the film El Gaucho, the Gaucho that uh, Fairbanks was also in that you can see on the top where he's smoking there. Um, the story of Murrieta goes that he uh, was riding into town one day, saw his poster that it was, you know, for a word of a thousand dollars and Murrieta got off of his horse and scoffed at it just as Fairbanks is doing there and said, so little. And he wrote on it, uh, I will give 10,000, right, for the capture of himself um, and signed it Joaquin. So uh, this shows up in the, the Mark of Zorro as uh, Zorro walks into there and sees a reward poster for his capture on the wall of the tavern. And instead of signing it, Joaquin, of course, he takes out his sword and carves his letter Z, his calling card. Zorro's ubiquitous Z is an echo of Joaquin Wood's own boasting signature. And so, but for the real Murrieta, time ran out. Um, the California governor set a reward for the capture, dead or alive, of Murrieta. Engine of California Rangers mustered for the pursuit of Murrieta and his capture, and they claimed to kill, have killed him. And then they cut off his head to be able to bring in and claim the reward for Murrieta, right? As a souvenir saying, this is Murrieta, give us the reward. The problem is, is that um, whether it was actually the real Murrieta, historians, including myself, have not been able to establish. There's so much legend and myth that surrounds this. But the fact of the matter is, is that there's affidavits saying, uh, where people testified before judges saying that there was indeed a human head inside a vat of alcohol. So somebody's head was in there. It could have just been a hapless Mexican 20-something who fit the bill. That possibility makes the decapitated head of Murrieta all the more gruesome and horrendous. For indeed, whatever the truth or fiction of the actual Murrieta, Mexican-Americans suffered under Anglo-American of the West. One historian notes that there were at least 800 71 documented cases of Mexicans who were lynched in some 13 uh, states in the American West after the Civil War. So the argument here is essentially that even if Murrieta didn't exist in, uh, as this sort of single identifiable person, the fact is, is that people saw in that story something that was true about their lived experience in California, that they came to California from Mexico to look for gold, or they were uh, Californios that lived in California before it became a state, and they were persecuted, lynched, uh, pursued, and even, um, you know, sort of killed and run out of town. And so it uncovers a certain kind of uh, uncomfortable truth about the mask of Zorro, that behind the mask of Zorro lies a, a truth about settler colonialism, about American racism, but also about the way in which the story over time became and has continued to be a symbol of fighting for justice against oppression. Murrieta first and later Zorro as of course, a more whitewashed literary offspring, preserve the real history of persecution, survival, and resistance of 
Latinx folks in the United States. As the villain from the 1998 film says, it's not just one man, damn it, it's Zorro, right? And so in an age when Latinx people are once again maligned, threatened, put in cages on the US border and called foreign to the American body politic, Zorro can become a symbol of resistance. Zorro matters. Why does Zorro matter? Well, because after 100 years, America still needs inspiration from forgotten legends that have been covered up. And when you uncover the truth behind some of those legends, you realize your present story needs to change or your present mythology needs to change. Murrieta and Zorro after him reveal the roots of Latinx culture and contribution to what makes America, well, America. Latinx history and experience helped birth the superhero in America. Massed Avengers who stand up for the oppressed and speak truth to power. It's as plain as Zorro's famous calling card. So thanks, that's all I have for you. Uh, and I would love um, to hear some questions. Let me stop sharing my screen. That was great, Stephen. Um, you're right, it's 100 years into the future. Um, and a lot, there are a lot of similarities with the experiences and what's going on in America. Um, global pandemic, right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> issues with racism, and um, it's that kind of, you, you talked about it earlier about how there's this uh, escapism that uh, a lot of people enjoy and, and desire through literature, uh, through comics, and through these superheroes. Super, uh, comics are not uh, a dirty secret of, of right. America anymore. It's a staple now. Now it's, it's very popular. It's very, not just popular, but they, it means a lot to, uh, to us. I have your book right here um, and with some marks. Yeah. Uh, I'm very, very glad I got to read some of it. Um, I, at some point you mentioned, and I like how you stated in your book, uh, the tie and the, or the connection between Zorro's dual identities, how yeah. he is by day, he's foppish Diego de la Vega. Um, and then by night he is El Zorro. Um, you tie it in, you tie that dual identity to a more modern term, which is called uh, code switching. Yeah. Um, can you remind us what code switching is and um, how that how that ties into things that we're doing now? Yeah, so I mean, um, it's kind of a, an interesting topic, right? Um, code switching starts off within, um, uh, you know, linguistics, right? It really is talking about um, bilingual people being able to um, switch to different languages. Um, and some of the ways in which in doing so, um, right, there are sort of similarities and bleeding in between the switching between those two things, but then also having to present a very different um, kind of, uh, of presentation of the language, right, when switching between those languages. Now, um, one of the most famous is this podcast run by um, by uh, National Public Radio, NPR, called Code Switch, right? And it talks about the ways in which um, culture, right, uh, is also uh, important in talking about things like race and racial identity. Um, you know, uh, the, one of the things that influenced me was thinking about um, W.E.B. Du Bois and his um, seminal kind of text, what he's probably remembered most for in terms of a, a single title called The Souls of Black Folk in 1909. And he talks about this sense of double consciousness um, uh, of having to sort of bear within one's body, you know, the, the sense of, uh, of blackness, but then also realizing that within the context of American society, that blackness is, is rejected. 
Um, and so I saw it in a character like Murrieta kind of shadows or like shadows. That wasn't supposed to be some clever allusion to the title, but um, I saw I saw some sort of nugget there of this sense of, um, you know, hiding behind a certain kind of, you know, Muriel was talked about as uh, the papers. One of the ways in which he was dangerous, right, was that um, that Anglo uh, newspapers would say he speaks English fluently and he has fair skin and light hair as somebody does or, or can you know phenotypically oftentimes from like northern mexico and sonora you see you know blonde hair and blue eyes perhaps more often um and uh this was a sense that but at any moment right could throw off that mask and he was joaquin right and so i saw this way in which um you know there is there's a way in which the part, you know, I obviously speak as, you know, a white American. And so I, I tried to do this with a bit of sensitivity and listening to others. And so to do so, I think um, one of the people that I, you know, graciously let me interview her was Rodnina Hart, who has been an awesome moderator for our own microcon. But I asked her about this sort of uh, dual identity uh, ness of superheroes, um, and she told me this um, that I want to quote, um, if I can find it. Um, okay, uh, Rodnina Rodnina Hart uh, provided some deeper insight. You have to look at the core of the character to see how much of their identities are tied up in the social climate they were developed in, um, right? And she's talking about the ways of making, um, is there a way to make certain superheroes, uh, you know, more diverse? Um, Okay, this is here. This is what I'm looking for. Thank you uh, for your patience and waiting for me. Um, she said, the super heroic alter ego is a fantastic analogy, perfect for demonstrating the necessity of managing perceptions for minority safety, success, well being, and growth. Superheroes, she continued, also bear the burden of a cloaked identity. Crossing that boundary is a heavy decision with great potential for personal loss, but also holds a chance to reap a great gain, uh, uh, to reap a great gain. Minorities do this tirelessly, she said, and with substantially less fanfare, right? And so, you know, I was also struck, you know, over the last couple of months thinking about, um, you know, wearing masks, right? Uh, uh, the, the way in which one of the, the rallying cries for many of the protests was, uh, you know, echoing George Floyd of I can't breathe, right? The sense of throwing off that mask, right? And the way in which I think um, there's something very unique and important about the American superhero that hasn't really touched. And I think we begin to see it in some of uh, more diverse superheroes, um, that are coming out now, you know, Black Panther and so on and so forth. But the way in which this um, sense of uh, protection and uh, holding up a certain mask or dual identity to society at times is important for safety um, uh, uh, within sort of a, a largely white, you know, sort of majoritarian society, but also important for a way in which, um, uh, you know, uh, new communities can find their own voices within, you know, a modern American superhero. So um, that's sort of some of my thoughts on that. But um, I think Rodnina said it better than, than I could have in trying to articulate some of the ways in which the American superhero uh, has part of that strain, which is rooted in diversity, not just in sort of, um, you know, sort of, uh, Anglo mainstream sort of ideas of whether, you know, uh, Batman or Superman, et cetera, and so forth.
That was well said. Uh, yeah, Radnina is, um, Radnina Hart is the division director at the Louisiana State Museum. So at the Capitol Park Museum, um, for anybody who's watching this, feel free to go to the museum. And um, she's she does an excellent job at um, just contextualizing history. And um, again, as you mentioned, she plays a part in our Mid-City Microcon, where we celebrate representation and diversity in comics and fandoms. Uh, so I'm really glad to hear that, uh, that she was able to um, give you some quotes that's yeah she's one of my favorite people <laughs> um well it's obvious that uh and as you had mentioned zorro uh is very was popularized in this white anglo um america you know me growing up my my zorro was uh, antonio banderas you know growing up that was who i saw uh zorro as um, and he's, he's been very much portrayed by a lot of, uh, Anglo and white actors, uh, white or white presenting actors. Um, I wonder, so, uh, one of our questions, uh, comes in, has, uh, what is, do you have, um, hold on, I'm trying to make sure that I say this right, uh, what is Zorro's role or uh, how is Zorro perceived um, in your in your book who you've interviewed through the Latinx lens, through um, uh, Latinx American fans? Right, right, right. Yeah, no, um, that's, a, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, okay, so there's, a more complex long answer, but I think the short answer is that um, one of the first uh, real treatments or reboots of Zorro was in um, the 2005 novel by Isabel Allende, um, where, you know, sort of this great uh, Latin American novelist uh, from, from Chile, she um, decided to take on Zorro and she was the first really to write him as a mestizo, as this uh, product, as a son of both a Spanish father and an indigenous woman um, and an indigenous mother. And that really did a lot for Zorro in making him more representative of the population of Southern California at the time, right? Uh, the original inhabitants of Southern California right, were a mix of, you know, Spanish, indigenous, um, you know, and uh, in African um, people, right, they were a mix of all of those kind of things. And so there's a sense that um, Zorro then with Isabel Allende's novel, and then in several line of comics since then, have acknowledged and begun to acknowledge the sort of diverse or the possibility of diversity within Zorro as Mestizo. And I think that has been more popular. Um, however, you know, when I think about some of my uh, friends that are, uh, uh, you know, Latino comic book uh, creators like Javier Hernandez, um, you know, he talks about growing up in Southern California and he was like the only sort of person that resembled me or my culture was Zorro. So I thought, Zorro was the guy that I wanted to, to be and emulate, right? So even in that, there's a way that uh, one scholar, Frederick Luis Aldama and uh, William Nariccio talk about the way in which even if there is whitewashed in inaccurate portrayals of, you know, yourself on the screen, there is also a way that we as viewers can take those in, sort of chew on them, metabolize them and spit them out in a way that reflects us and uh, does justice for us because we change them to suit our needs. We change them to um, to suit what we need in them, right? To make them more representative, et cetera. And so um, I think that is a similar process that's happened with Zorro that even though, you know, for most of Zorro's history, these 100 years, he's oftentimes been the Spaniard of blue blood, kind of more white, um, et cetera. Uh, there is a sense that 
um, he has become um, a heroic figure for many um, Latinx people um, because of the the agency of these people of these viewers to to say, well, that might be what you're giving me, but what I'm going to give back is something that is more authentic, more um, more representative. Uh, you know, another guy um, that uh, he does this character El Gato Negro, the black cat, right? And he talks about the way in which um, Zorro is, um, uh, you know, hugely sort of influential on him. And he sent me recently um, a, a really cool picture of Zorro congratulating El Gato Negro as El Gato Negro is, you know, sort of the next superhero sort of in the line of superheroes. And here's Zorro welcoming him, you know, right? Um, and so it, it says less about the creativity of sort of the established media, and it says more about the imagination of fandoms, as you were talking about, like the creativity of fandoms to, in, in some ways, demand that they're the things that they love represent them. You know, um, And so that's what's really cool, I think, about a character like Zorro, Spider-Man, Right, other you know Miles Morales, Spider Man, all these kind of characters that are being, um, you know, not all the old lore is not being totally thrown out, but there's a way in which uh, new voices, new suits are being added to add to these different kinds of passions. And I've said before that one of my favorite quotes about uh, uh, Comic Con is by this guy Glenn Weldon, who wrote a book on Batman, and he said. Um, you know, same passion, just different suits. That's what my, uh, that's what Comic Cons are. And in that sense, um, the problem within comics for a long time, within media for a long time, was the fact that there was that same passion, but there weren't enough suits um, to go around to to be able to express that, to express one's own identity, and. Um, now that's beginning to be the case, and it's really only beginning to be the case because um, brave, creative people, uh, you know, um, regardless of their, uh, you know, racial, sexual identity, are beginning to ha have their uh, voices heard. You know, so um, so I think Zorro fits within that story as well. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we do as America, and we have a history of. Um, Anglo white people telling stories uh, of other uh, telling stories of other cultures in those voices and um, like you explore in this book it's important to dig into um, the story yeah. dig into that history and to be aware um, it's especially especially with superheroes that we hold on a pedestal like this is this right. is ideal this is who we want to be with but we want to make sure that we know um okay well the context this this character was written by a white anglo man right. in the early 1900s that comes with its, with its own um issues um we have one more question i have uh so somebody has has asked who currently owns the intellectual property for el zorro <laughs> Uh, that would be Zorro Productions uh, International. Um, yeah, so it's a story that I uh, briefly touch on in the book. Um, Macaulay, right, wrote the Zorro novels um, and stories and did so until his death in 1958. Um, but before that, he had a literary agent. Um, and this literary agent um, helped broker the deal with Disney to do the Disney uh, TV show. But um, then after the TV show ended, after uh, Walt Disney died, um, uh, Macaulay died, the rights reverted to um, this literary agent, essentially. Um, and then literary agent died. Um, and then the rights reverted to that literary agent's uh, children. And so the guy, John Gertz, that owns the, um, the literary 
rights to Zorro is the son of Johnston McCauley's literary agent. Um, but they license them out to different people to do things. So right now the uh, American uh, mythology um, is the comics uh, company that is has the license for for Zorro. But uh, perhaps you know there will be other uh, interesting crossovers in in the future with Zorro. Uh, there's talk of a movie made of Zorro and Django um, to be uh, to be made. Uh, you know, sort of Django Unchained, the movie, this would be kind of a sequel to that where Zorro teams up with Django and then we have to, uh, you know, uh, there's kind of an interesting relationship there. Django obviously trying to bring bring down the system of oppression and Zorro always trying to more reform it. And so there's kind of a clash of vision there um, in terms of what is justice um, and how is justice brought about. And so um, that will be interesting. Hopefully that comes out. Um, and hopefully it'll, you know, sort of spur a, a new interest in, in Zorro. Um, one of the things that I think I say in the book is that, um, you know, for Zorro to live, there has to be new, uh, stories told to bring, breathe life in it. Um, just like any story that we tell over time, um, it, it, it's only going to ultimately mean something to the, pe to the people that, hear it if it speaks to them to today right to their needs in the present and so um that's why i think there's more chance for the zorro of the future to perhaps um embody some of the ideals and values that we have um and that we're talking about today about inclusivity about diversity about um uh sort of a, a more accurate depiction um of what our society looks like right so Right. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, this was, I re like I said, I really enjoyed reading uh, your book. I enjoyed traveling with you around <laughs> the the West because you you drive to these different places and you explore and you discover these primary documents in these places. Um, and I imagine that was a blast. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I really enjoyed yeah. this book. Um, aside from the library, uh, where we'll be getting this in our collection soon, where can we work on our viewers and where can we uh, find and buy your book? Yeah, uh, well, you can get it at uh, any, any place that good books are sold. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, it's not everywhere. Um, so, you know, Amazon, of course, um, go, you know, just search for Zorro. Uh, Chicago Review Press is the uh, um, the press that put it out. Um, you can buy it there, Amazon. You can also do it at bookshop.org. Um, some local support, uh, you can buy the book through them, um, such as uh, Cavalier House Books, but also um, Red Stick Reads. Um, if you go to those, both of those, you can find the book. And usually it's a little cheaper than Amazon sometimes. And so I would that would be my first, you know, support them, local uh, indie bookshops. Um, and then uh, it's also available on Audible. So you can hear, hear uh, it wasn't me who read it, but somebody else, but um, you can you can hear it. Um, I think he does a much better job of, uh, of reading it than I would. So I'm glad he did it. Um, but yeah, so thank you. Great, and, uh, and where can we learn more about you and the work you do? Oh, right. It's not your only book. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, well, I have a website called uh, Zorro's Ghost um, that you can go to, as well as on Twitter, at Steve Andes. Um, I'm sort of tweeting out there. Um, and so those are the places you can find me. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and thank everybody for watching. Uh, this, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, this presentation is recorded. It'll be available shortly after, if you're familiar with how Facebook Live works. Um, if you are curious about Zorro or Latinx history, American history, pop culture, film, comics, head to the East Baton Rouge Parish Library or your local library, and we have lots of resources for you to explore and maybe write your own book. So thank you, yep. Stephen, for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Have a good night. Okay. Good night.